Obey ECOWAS judgments and end persecutions for cyber stalking, Sarab tells Buhari. And in the aftermath of the 2023 elections, tonight we discuss divisive politics and reconciliations among warring parties. This is Plus Politics. My name is Nyamgul Agaji. The Socio-Economic Rights and Accountability Project, SERAP, has urged President Muhammad Buhari to use his good offices and leadership position to immediately enforce the judgment by the ECOWAS Court of Justice prohibiting prosecutions of anyone on the grounds of insulting or stalking public officials online. SERAP also urged him to enforce and implement the ECOWAS Court judgment compelling the government to respect, protect and promote freedom of expression access to information and media freedom. In a letter dated 1st of April 2023 and signed by Serap Deputy Director Kolawole Oluwadare, the organization expressed serious concerns about the shrinking civic space in the country as some state governors and government institutions are reportedly using Section 24 of the Cyber Crime Act and other repressive laws to crack down on anyone seeking to assert their human rights and media freedom. We're being joined live to discuss this by Kolawole Oluwadari himself, Deputy Director, Serap. Good evening and welcome to the program, Kolawole. Good evening. Happy to be here. Thank you. Let us begin with what this uh, almighty Section 24 is. Give us an insight as to uh, what it portends, what it says, what it's, the implications of this Section 24 are to the human rights and freedom of speech and everything that we're talking about today. Um, thank you. Um, the act, or the law, it's an act, but it's called probably a law. It's an act of the National Civil Nigeria. It's the Cyber Crimes Act, and it has various sections. but. Uh, within the context of this discussion and uh, uh, the ambit of it, it's used by Nigerian authorities, Section 24 stands out as a notorious section that has been used by the government uh, to prosecute various classes of Nigerians, particularly journalists or people who are perceived as being critical of government or public officers or those who have access to recovery of power. And Section 24 of the Cyber Crimes Act uh, uh, is basically talks about cyber stalking and it creates some very big uh, offenses, even with the wordings of the section, which led Sarah uh, to go to court in 2019, that is the Air Corps Court, uh, challenging the provisions of Section 24 vis a vis the provisions of the African Charter, which naturally uh, grants every Nigerian, Nigeria being a member of Air Corps, um, freedom of expression. And in this instance, freedom of expression has also constitutionally guaranteed in our constitution, allows, uh, is a two-pronged right. It allows us to have conversations like this, but is to express yourself and to receive information. And we know how this is important to democracy and to what we are as human beings, as us Nigerians. And so Section 24 has been used uh, to charge people to court for various offenses, for whatever I said, even WhatsApp messages, uh, posts on social media, and the likes, and that is why we come to court. And the request court ruled that Section 24 of the Cyber Crimes Act is incompatible with the rights granted by Article 9 of the African Charter, which is which has been ratified by Nigeria as a member of the ECOWAS of the ECOWAS. And also, in the 2020, we've gone to court to challenge the unlawful ban of Twitter. And the same ECOWAS court spoke clearly without missing words that the Nigerian government should take steps. Um, to ensure that the freedom of expression of Nigerians are guaranteed. And not particularly at all. The first judgment clearly gave an order to the Nigerian government to repeal Section 24 of the Cyber Crimes Act. So, naturally, 
what the government of Nigeria should do through the Attorney General of the Federation is to place uh, legislation before the National Assembly to amend Section, to amend the Senate Crimes Act by repealing Section 24 of that Act. And we've seen the various ways that have been misused, if you ask me. And that is why we've undertaken this advocacy to ensure that that unlawful use of a law that has been declared unlawful by the courts is, is stopped. Okay, when you talk about repealing Section 24, is it is in its entirety or there are just aspects of that section that are not agreeable to Serap and, the, and whatever we can describe as human rights? No, it is the entirety of Section 24. And that is why when you see the way Section 24 of the Cyber Crimes Act is worded enough, it is subject in view. It, it creates offenses that says that if the person who receives the message, if he or she considers it obscene. And so, Yambo, yeah, I put it to you. If I send you a message, which is a conversation between both of us, and you consider such message to be obscene, and it's just a conversation between two of us, that would actually give me a right to make a complaint to the uh, law enforcement agencies to charge me for cyber stalking under Section 24. And we all know that law as a tool of social engineering progresses. It catches up, it sets the pace, as it were, for society and the norms that govern uh, being human. Uh, it sets the trend for us to follow. And in this instance, where the advent of social media and the various tools of communication as technology has brought our way, Section 24 is not only a danger to freedom of expression, it is a danger to democracy in the way it has been used and the way it is couched. And most importantly, a very good aspect of Section 21, for instance, or that's subsection 1, is that it prescribes a penalty of seven million naira and not more than three years imprisonment for people who are who are found culpable in this act. You would agree with me that that is too heavy a sentence for such a law that can be used as a win, particularly in the in the hands of law enforcement agencies in Nigeria, who we've seen time and again uh, who have a penchant uh, for uh, abusing uh, abusing their powers. Okay, well, when we're talking about the fact that someone can can just interpret it the way they like it. Because like one of my lecturers used to say, meanings are in people, not in words. So you say something and somebody decides to interpret it in another way. But the question is, whose standards or which standard or what standards are we going to use to define what is supposed to be um, something that can put you in trouble, for instance, or something that you will say uh, is not supposed to be said? It's cyber bullying, cyber crime, cyber whatever you want to call it. What standards are we going to use to define this thing so that we know? Because there is a very thin line between this uh, uh, freedom of speech and, and, um, and what ca we cannot call freedom of speech, where some, somebody just says whatever they like because of the anonymity which social media, for instance, uh, provides. We, the, the proximity or the the remoteness that the social media provides. Because what you will say to my face, you might not, uh, what you might not say to my face, you will say it because I'm not there and all that. So how do we define at least, because there needs to still be some kind of sanity, no matter what. How do we define standards with which we can use to judge whether something is worthy enough for someone to uh, prosecute you for? Uh, thank you, Dr. And that's a very interesting perspective which is some of the arguments that we have made before the courts in a various advocacy initiatives to government in respect of Section 24 and the freedom of expression. And I think we need to preface this conversation by understanding, firstly, uh, the nature of, of the act itself and what Section 24 protects, which is why we argue that the section itself and the wording of the section and the use, uh, which are two different things, and they are very subjective. So Section 24 prayer, uh, provides, for instance, that if a message, if, so, if anyone sends a message, I'm paraphrasing now, sends a message to another by means of a computer, a system, or a network that is grossly offensive, pornographic, indecent, or obscene or menacing in character, and it causes to be sent, it becomes a prayer. And then you ask that you are asked, whose view will be considered by the court or even by the law enforcement agencies in charging someone to call this section, whether a message is obscene, is menacing, or what. And within the context of this conversation, human rights are not absolute. And the law, for instance, the constitution in providing for freedom of expression in Section 39 has also provided limits 
And this limit has also provided legal remedies when there is a breach, which of course leads to uh, anybody being more culpable for defamation, as it were, or libel, depending on the nature of such uh, statement or the tone. But that does not mean that such actions should be criminalized. At best, there are civil remedies for such actions, and we've seen people uh, make this option uh, to uh, go to court over the years, and there's a lot of jurisprudence on defamation, libel, and slander. Do we need to criminalize freedom of expression? No. Uh, and that is why the government must act in line with the objectives of the African Charter and the various treaties and conventions that they have ratified, including the 1999 Constitution. The actions of government should promote human rights in this context, freedom of expression, not to stifle it. Which is why we believe, and the court agrees with us, and the court has agreed with us in the court's court, that Section 24 must be repealed to conform so that it can be in line with Article 9 of the African Charter, Section 39 of the Constitution, and various conventions and treaties that Nigeria has ratified to ensure that the freedom of expression of Nigerians are guaranteed and not unnecessarily stifled. So, in this context, what we've seen is the wordings, the subjective wordings of Section 24 and the misuse of Section 24. Those two reasons uh, I, I, is why the court agreed with Sarah and gave that judgment, which is yet to be enforced by me. Okay, but when you're talking, you're talking for the people because the people are the ones that always uh, get these, um, get prosecuted as it is. We see uh, radio and TV stations being clamped down on because they, they express themselves. We also see, for instance, there's a, um, a journalist, Agba Jalingo, that has just been released today after so many days in custody, custody because he wrote something and asked a question and... Uh, Someone who is related to the governor of his state felt insulted and he was taken to prison. And this is not the first time and all that. There are so many other instances that abound. But when we argue for the people, what are we also arguing for, let's say, politicians uh, who are being slandered, uh, is subjective anyway, who are being uh, taken to the cleaners, as, as it were? What part of your argument is also protecting them? Uh, you know, I had mentioned earlier uh, that the law has envisaged uh, that, that limit uh, of human rights where individuals can be free of the rights of others. And that is why the law has made provision in civil law for defamation, which will libel us if it's written in, in, in permanent form and it will become slander if it's uttered in temporary form. And that is why it is a civil law. It need not be made a crime. And that is what Section 24 of the Cyber Crime has done, which is why, again, we have seen his misuse over and over. It is a civil law, and there are remedies for defamation. You could get damage, you get reparations. There are a lot of remedies, and people have got to court on this instance. So the question is why should freedom of expression and the breach of it, if uh, you, other rights of people are breached, why should it be criminalized? It's a civil law, and a civil remedies. Why should it be criminalized? And that is what has lent itself to this misuse that we've seen. So for people who have their rights in things or who are, who, are, who are defamed or slandered as it were, there's a remedy for them in law and they should take that off. I, I don't seem to understand because if you're being arrested for defamation and you call it defamation, does it sounds as if it is all right because the laws are already there. But if you are arrested because you use the other term that is a cyber bullying or cyber stalking, it seems to be something that should not you should not be arrested for or something. Make it make sense to me how someone can be, it could be a libel, it could be a scandal, and then you can be arrested because the laws are there for them. And you're saying they should not criminalize the same thing that you are being arrested for if you call it a different name. I, I just don't seem to understand. I'm not arguing uh, <laughs> differently. Let me explain. Yes, please. Basically, there is, you know, there is civil law and there is criminal law among the various divisions of law. A civil, a civil law will be the rights and obligations of individuals even amongst themselves or between organizations or even institutions of government or among those of government uh, as the case may be. And in that case, a civil wrong will be, for instance, breach of contract. And defamation is a civil wrong as it were. So if, okay. as we're having this conversation, I call you a name that you do not like, you will go to court against me and ask for damages or whatever reparations you want. That is a civil wrong. That is not a crime. But Section 24 makes it a crime 
which means it is a crime against the state, which is why law enforcement agencies will have to come in to arrest you. So ideally, nobody should be arrested for defamation because it's a civil law. You can't go to court. But when it becomes a crime, in this instance, Section 24, it means that it is the state prosecuting you on behalf of another, okay. which is why I'm making that case that you need to not be criminalized. There are remedies in civil law that can be explored, and that is being explored. Okay, I, I, get, the, I get the argument right now. But uh, to be fair, um, it is not really a Nigerian thing, you know that. It's not even an ECOWAS thing, because we have instances, for instance, in, in France, where a 50-year-old woman uh, is facing trial. He, she was being arrested for publicly, what they say, insulting President Macron. We also had in September 2021, where something like that happened, and a 62-year-old person was arrested as well. So why is it such a big issue here? in Nigeria and ECOWAS that you needed to go to court when it seems as if it is happening everywhere else? Or is it that everywhere it is happening, it should be condemned in the same way? Um, I'm not aware of these instances that you mentioned. And I'm sure there are contextual facts that possibly pay, place them in a different realm entirely. But be that as it may, um, social media and the digital age brings along the new trend of its own, which means that rights are cool to us naturally in the real world, sometimes get trusted, has been translated to, uh, to the virtual space. That itself has brought up a lot of issues, and it's a global thing, and that uh, the limits and the extents of these rights are being tested for either digital rights, data rights, and all that. But that does not remove the essence of the fundamental rights that is enshrined in various laws of countries. And in this context, in the Constitution and the African Charter and various treaties and conventions that Nigeria has ratified, which is why the misuse of these laws in a democracy is bad, not only for us as citizens, but also the democracy. If you can get into trouble and be charged for a crime for a statement that has been made, which in itself is not obscene, is not insulting, but because the recipient faith feels, and that is very important for us to understand it, the recipient feels insulted, then he activates criminal procedures against you. This sets a very difficult trend uh, for democracy, particularly in Nigeria, where we have been known to have little tolerance, particularly those in public offices who have little tolerance for criticism of any, of any kind. About, I'm, I'm trying to draw the line between, between a, um, a right and a nuisance and all that. And uh, leaving that aside, do you think the laws that were enacted before the craze of uh, social media and every other thing that has given people the opportunity to talk the way they talk and get into trouble in some instances, do you think the laws can also speak to the situation we find ourselves now? For instance, what was not insulting 10 years ago could be a very big insult now, but it's not covered by the law. So do you think we should start uh, by you know, tweaking a little bit about the law or, yeah, touching the law a little bit, or we should just start by saying we stop everything concerning trying to get people to pay for careless statements that they make. Do you think our laws can still, can still stand? That will not make for meaningful conversations, which, as you know, is very important to democratic practice. People have the right to exchange ideas. And it's very interesting that politicians, when they want to get the votes of people, use every available platform, including social media, to canvass for votes, including speaking against their opponents. And it is fine at that time until they gain political power. And then all of a sudden, the same tool and instrument they used to fully express themselves to the citizens becomes a tool that gets other people into trouble. And that is why we need to understand the concept of freedom of expression as a right. It's, manif it's manifestations in various contexts, that is the use, and the law as it were. So to answer your question, yes, laws as tools of social engineering sometimes are slow to cut off reality, and sometimes, depending on the aspect of each country's uh, uh, jurisprudence, sometimes the law also sets a precedent that society follows uh, subsequently as part of the social norms. So you have asked, do we have laws that are adequate for the issues, these digital issues? Yes. The laws are not perfect. Laws are not 
not meant to be perfect, which is why they are amended. And in this instance, judicial pronouncements are it is one of the ways of, of amending laws because the court has held that section 24 a conflict with Article 9 of the African Charter and should be repealed. And that means that section 24, as it stands today, of the Sabah Kansas Act, is null and void. It is not a law that should be used at all. The Nigerian government must obey that all of court. So do we need to tweak the laws? Not necessarily so. What we need for first and foremost within the context of our democracy is to have strong institutions that can apply the laws. I can tell you, young girl, that our laws are not perfect, but we have, we have a much more bigger problem in the application of the laws by the various institutions tasked with this uh, statutory duty. And that is what we need to fix first, even as we are in the process of amending the laws. And that is why you see the various manifestations of this misuse of these public institutions in one way or another. It, it's really becoming a matter of state capture. If we allow this to go on, it, it, it doesn't go for democracy at all. But this issue of strong institutions instead of strong people and all that is, is always a back and forth. It's a case of egg and, and, and chicken, which one came first and all that. What do you treat first and the others? An institution is governed by laws, and we have the laws. An institution is governed by rules, and we have the rules. But they still are not working. So what is that element that is missing that is making our institutions not to be strong enough? We have a constitution that people are clearly not following. The law enforcement agencies are flouting the law, uh, flouting the laws themselves. The politicians are doing the same. Even the people themselves are doing the same because no matter what you do, whether you're stealing from a government coffers or you're beating traffic because you think nobody's looking, a crime is a crime. So what is that ingredient that is lacking, that is making our institutions not to work the way they should work and people are rather bigger than the institutions? Uh, thank you, Andrew. I will attempt to answer this, uh, to define the, the cause of this malady. Um, I would say it is the lack of political will from the highest office in Nigeria, from the president uh, to that of the least. You have, as you've said, we have laws. The laws created institutions and created parameters for them to act, including providing for sanctions, whether for acts of omission and commission. So the question is, how far have those laws been implemented by these institutions? If you ask me very weakly and very poorly, and that has led us to this point. And that again brings us back to the social contract theory. We all know that we have these rights, we have these powers as human beings, which is why they are called natural rights. But we donated an aspect of this power to the state in this instance to enforce those rights on everyone, to protect everyone. So, but when the state becomes corrupt, when the state becomes inefficient, what you've seen is exactly what we're seeing presently as a country is what that leads to, which is why we need strong institutions that are not stronger than the law. We need strong institutions that obey the law. And institutions, of course, are not made up of robots. They are made up of people. The structures are made up of people, which is why we need every political office, including the president, obeying the laws. But in a country, such as Nigeria, where we see institutions of government, state governors, and individuals, public institutions disobeying orders of court. What do you expect? That is against the ingredient of the rule of law. It's against the core tenets of democracy. And nobody gets punished for it. We talk of corruption every now and then. We've seen individuals that have been found to be corrupt. They've been liable and nobody gets punished for it. What do you expect? And so that is what has led us here. So rather than complain about the laws we have, which I agree with you is not perfect, we should talk about and we put our money where our mouth is to ensure that the institutions function. Again, the institutions are not stronger than the law. They must operate within the confines of the law. It means even the judiciary is not above the law. They interpret the law, they enforce the laws. It means even the enforcement agencies, including the police, they are not above the laws. They, um, they operate within the uh, confines of the law. But what we've seen uh, so far is the exact opposite. And that, unfortunately, has led us to where we are presently in nearly every facet uh, of, of women and women in Nigeria. It's so sad, really. It, it is sad. Uh, I, must, I must congratulate Sarah for a milestone judgment that they have, and uh, we hope that things will work. But while we, we talk about not gagging the people, we would also like to balance it. If you were to advise, because it's always been a problem, uh, on the one hand, we'll be talking about people making careless statements. On the other hand, we're talking about 
the need to let people express themselves and all that. But there has to be a balance. At one point, Twitter was banned from Nigeria because of a statement that was made against the president. Whether that was right or wrong, but it, it tells you that there is a need for all of us to know, to respect ourselves in one way or the other. So if we were to advise on the kind of things to be put in place so that there will be sanity in the social media space and also there will be freedom of expression from the people, what would you advise that should be done? As we wrap up now. Unfortunately, I'm going to have to go to what I've said earlier. It means the institutions must work and operate within the confines of the law. We have laws already. The Constitution provides for rights, including freedom of expression, and also provides for the limits of those rights. And Section 6 of the Constitution is very clear. It gives the judiciary the powers to be the arbiter between uh, providing rights and obligations and duties between individuals, between government agencies, and between government and the people. But the question is, if the courts give judgment and the government obeys or disobeys the or judgment, what do you expect to have? So again, when you talk of social media and the need to govern that space, whatever that means, we have laws already. We have the fundamental human rights that prescribes the limits of these laws. And we have defamation laws. We have all those in place. But how are they being enforced? Which is why you see criminal laws like Section 24 of the Cyber Crime Act that can be used to hold people. They are being used more than any other law. And that is the sad, unfortunate uh, thing that we've seen happen, which shouldn't be with democracy. Kola Wale, we are still with you. And uh, would like to just wrap up with you very fast as as fast as possible, I'd like to challenge uh, Serap Sir, and ask you what you're really doing to make sure that you educate the people more about their rights and responsibilities, cultivate the habit of uh, patriotism and every other thing that we need. Because at the end of the day, it is not the institutions that are not having the requisite things that should make them work. The laws are there, the rules are there, and everything. The buildings are there, even, even though that is not what we should uh, describe as the institutions when we are talking about it. But what are you doing? What is your plan to make sure the citizens come up to speed and even help in the fight that Serap has been fighting all along to make our country, our climate, uh, everything saner, as everybody likes to say, saner climate and all that. Nigeria should move from where it is to another place, a higher pedestal. So what is your plan to make sure the citizens are up to speed with what you've been doing, the fight you've been fighting, and to stand up to their responsibility? Very briefly, please. Thank you. A public enlightenment is also a critical part of their advocacy initiatives, which is why this kind of letter to the government is called is what we call a two-pronged advocacy. It informs the government and calls on them to fulfill salutary obligations and also reminds the people of the rights and the duties and the obligations that they have. Even this conversation that we are having presently also fulfills that very important obligation. It is enlightening people, it is educating them and calling on people to obey the laws. So and that is what we do uh, as part of our initiative. And I really felt that now when your freedom of expression was briefly taken away, you understand how it feels when freedom of expression is stifled in any way. Okay, well, thank you very much, Kola Wale for coming uh, to enlighten us on what is happening. And uh, everybody that needs to collaborate will collaborate with you. Keep doing the good job and make sure you do more to enlighten us as well so that we can help you in that fight. Thank you so much for being a part of our program today. Thank you. Okay, we've been talking with uh, Kola Wale Oluwadari, a Deputy Director of CERAP, and we'll take a short break and when we return we'll be talking to another guest. Stay with us.